In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the Ariadne principle. Ariadne is a tool or a method or a scheme for the exploration and the explanation of digital artifacts. We have developed Ariadne at the Computer Science Education Research Department of Paderborn University. Now, first of all, you might ask yourself what a digital artifact might be. A digital artifact we call everything that can be the subject of an explanation, which is also a product. So a digital artifact is not a, a, a mere concept, but a, such a device is a digital artifact, a piece of software is a digital artifact, a word file on your hard drive would be a digital artifact, the hard drive itself you could call a digital artifact, even an algorithm, even though it is not necessarily fully implemented, can be treated as a digital artifact, even though the focus lies more on products, on complete products here in this case. Uh, what we want to do with Ariadne is introduce a number of perspectives on a digital artifact and then interrelate those to each other in order to make an explanation richer. The first perspective uh, everyone has on a digital artifact is that of its features. An artifact has certain features and those features are used to do things with that artifact. Within this video, I always use WhatsApp as an example in the assumption that all of you know what WhatsApp is and have most likely used it before or you have used similar instant messaging tools. And even if you have not, I'm sure you know what that is. The most basic feature WhatsApp has is the ability to send back and forth text from one person to another person or from one person to a group of people. Not all features, by the way, are intended by the creators of an artifact. Sometimes one calls those proper features. So a proper feature of um, WhatsApp would be me sending a text to a friend of mine. That would be a proper feature. Um, but uh, WhatsApp can be used in different ways. And an example of those has been told to us a while ago. Uh, there was someone who told us she is using WhatsApp as a shopping list. So she uses it as a tool which persistently saves those messages she sends in there. How did she do that? She created a group and she created a group with a random um, person. That doesn't, ma doesn't matter who that is because that person is immediately removed from that group. That results in a group with only one person in it and WhatsApp allows such groups. You can be the last person within a group. Now she uses that group and posts her shopping items, her list of items she has to, uh, to think about for her shopping, into that very list. And uh, of course then she can look into the group and always has these items uh, available to her because they are persistently saved. It would even be possible to fill it on the computer and then to look into it on the smartphone because this kind of synchronization exists. This is of course not an intended use. Um, WhatsApp, Meta is the company behind that, uh, is of course not interested or hasn't created WhatsApp for the purpose of storing notes like that. But it is possible, so it is a feature. It is a feature which WhatsApp, due to the way it is created, allows. So features can be both intended and can be created while using an artifact. Well, of course, if we would uh, refrain ourselves to always only describing features, uh, this description would be kind of limited. Sometimes those descriptions or such kinds of descriptions are useful, like in manuals, like when you uh, want to know how to set up your Wi-Fi. You look for a manual which says, click here, click there, put that here, enter that information here. That's, of course, very feature-based. And it has its value, but of course it does not allow you to understand what is happening uh, and why things are happening. If we want to understand that, if we don't only want to um, 
describe certain things from a feature point of view but want to understand the artifact there are many other things we have to consider so we have other perspectives on the artifact we could for example look at the artifact from a perspective of mathematics science and technology and on the other hand we could look at the artifact from a perspective of societal discourse so all deliberations uh, made in, uh, in society regarding the artifact and how it is used. Of course, these perspectives are way too vast. We cannot, on the one hand, look into the fundamentals of mathematics or into the fundamentals of uh, physics, something like string theory, in order to explain what WhatsApp does. Of course, there is a connection, but it is not practical to, use, uh, to speak about that. And on the other hand, we would also not want to engage in um, the fundamentals of philosophy, the fundamentals of uh, political science, of sociology, and, uh, well, explain how democracy works, something like that, in order to explain WhatsApp. Of course, WhatsApp has a relation to concepts like democracy, but the distance is too big, it's too far away uh, to be useful for an explanation of WhatsApp. So um, we have to make a smaller selection and that is depicted by this cloud here. And it is a cloud because uh, the boundaries are not always clear. I cannot tell you that something necessarily has to be part of an explanation and, and something else necessarily must never. Within this cloud, we still have these two big perspectives. And uh, this one here, which is related to mathematics, science and technology, we call the architecture of an artifact. This is a perspective which computer scientists, technicians in general, are very familiar with. They are not merely interested in what one can do with an artifact like WhatsApp, but are interested in the structure and the architecture of that artifact. Uh, they would uh, analyze that, of course, that's not only the app, but there's also a server, so there's a client-server architecture involved. There are communications protocols involved here. There are certain algorithms working inside uh, the artifact we call WhatsApp. There are data structures in there and so forth. So that is a very technical perspective on an artifact. It explains how the artifact is constructed and how it works internally, whereas the feature describes what you can do with it. Then, of course, we have the other big sphere, and the other sphere we call the relevance of an artifact. Within this sphere perspective of relevance, there is the question what an artifact is used for. Hmm. For features, I have just told you that features describe what you can do with an artifact. And on the relevance side, we care about what it is used for. What's the difference? Um, WhatsApp is used for many, many things. One can, for example, use WhatsApp to maintain friendships. That is, of course, not a feature of WhatsApp. There's no uh, friends management feature in WhatsApp. There's no button for that. You can put it like that. Uh, what you can do with WhatsApp, and that's what is done, is sending back and forth text messages. What it is used for, um, so the use context, that is, of course, way more, and there's much more involved in that, like um, ideas about communication, um, ideas about hierarchy, etc. That is all part of uh, the relevance. Relevance also um, includes what uh, the influences are. And, of course, there's a big influence of a tool like WhatsApp on society. Um, a very good example you can often witness uh, when on holiday. Um, you often see people uh, using WhatsApp similar tools all the time uh, while on holiday. Years ago, decades ago, when you were on holiday, you were away. You were not available for your friends, for your boss, for your family. Nowadays, you are um, available for them. You are contactable all the time and you are expected to answer immediately 
even when you are on holiday. And that is a consequence of the existence of such artifacts. But it's not that easy. It's not only the consequence of the existence, but it's also the consequence of a certain desire. Oh, also part of the relevance is what one associates with an artifact. Um, so let's uh, speak about WhatsApp again. Um, I know that WhatsApp is owned by Meta, which is also the company which owns Facebook. And that company has a reputation. And I associate some bad feelings with WhatsApp. Um, I always fear that mm, maybe there are gathering data which I do not want them to have. That's also an aspect of the relevance of this artifact WhatsApp. So these are the big two perspectives. We have the architecture uh, on the one hand and the relevance on the other hand. And of course, they both together form the features. You could say that a feature without architecture is kind of baseless and a feature without relevance is kind of senseless. And only those two allow one to think about features uh, at all. Even though they are the starting point, uh, always architecture and relevance is involved uh, in features. So now you see already that there is an interrelation between architecture, relevance and features. And this interrelation can be very complex. If you want to understand how an artifact came to existence, why an artifact is the way it is, um, we have to interrelate those perspectives and we have to interrelate them uh, by looking at the genesis of the artifact. That means there is an interrelation between architecture and relevance and features over time. When tools like WhatsApp were new, there was no encryption involved. So you entered some text into your uh, mobile phone and sent it to um, the server. That might have been encrypted already, but at the server side it was possible for the company to read the text you have written. Uh, what they did, when what they always promised to do, is always to only forward it uh, to uh, the recipient, uh, but they were able to uh, also read it and to evaluate what they have read. For example, they would have been able to send you commercials based on what you were writing, or they were able to uh, inform the police based on what you were writing. At least theoretically, that was possible. Um, this possibility did not concern too many people for a number of years, but then there was a discussion in society, so we now go to the relevance side of things, um, uh, like uh, the, the fact that uh, there were some revelations about um, intelligence agencies spying on companies, spying on uh, governments, and uh, there was a discussion about the security of communication. Um, and this uh, discussion, which was of course institutionalized by uh, political parties, by associations, by the media, had quite an influence on the developers of those artifacts. Um, so that a company like Meta, even though there were of course the market leaders um, and well, could expect people to continue to use their products, feared that people might switch to something else or not use it anymore. So they changed uh, the architecture of the artifacts so that nowadays uh, WhatsApp and many, many other instant messengers have an end-to-end -end encryption. So it's technically not possible anymore to read the text at the server side, which is only a relay uh, for sending the message from one person to the other. So that is, of course, a change and an interrelation which you can explain when you look at the genesis of the artifact. So how did the presence of an artifact change what is done in society? And how did societal discourses regarding an artifact change its further development? That can be both, of course, in terms of features, but also in terms of 
architectural aspects which are behind the scenes, like this end-to-end -end encryption. This is, of course, not something that one sees on the feature level. It happens transparently um, in the background. This interrelation is necessary to explain why the artifact is the way it is. If you do not look at that, you can, of course, describe the architecture, you can describe aspects of relevance, you can describe the features, but for an explanation, you need this kind of interrelation over time. A consequence of this, by the way, is the insight, and it's a very, very important insight, that technology is never neutral. Uh, of course, technology always has an influence on society. That is one thing. But even if you wanted to um, limit yourself to descriptions of architecture, you say, this part of the cloud I'm not interested in at all, uh, and I only look at the architecture side of things, even then it is not neutral because, of course, the architecture has its history. Uh, this is true in many aspects. Uh, I have given you one example uh, just a moment ago that, of course, there has been the influence of discourses on the relevance side which uh, implied changes on the architectural uh, side. Uh, but even without that, there is, of course, always history in the architecture because nobody creates an artifact from scratch. Um, those uh, intelligent people who have come up with the idea of an app uh, like WhatsApp have not started from scratch. They have used components which were already there. They rely heavily on internet architecture. They will use encryption algorithms, communication algorithms which already exist. And it of course makes sense to do so. Nobody should create uh, encryption algorithms just by oneself. Uh, that would very likely lead to disaster. But of course all those parts which are kind of bundled together in an artifact, uh, they already have their history and they bring their history into the architecture. So uh, there's always history and there's always relevance and genesis involved when looking at an architecture. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that. And another aspect of that is uh, when I try to speak about architecture, I do it as a human being and I have my background and I bring this background into my description of architecture. And without this background, I could not speak about it at all. Um, let's take this smartphone here as an example. Um, this smartphone, of course, I could take apart and look at its architecture from a hardware point of view. And uh, what I would find there is a, a number of uh, microchips and I could identify uh, one of those chips as the main processor and then there is a camera module and then there is a certain area in here uh, which uh, is uh, responsible for Wi-Fi connections, etc. And that is, of course, a very neutral description, you might say, but it is not. Um, you can only understand what I have just said because we have a certain common context. If you would not know what I meant when I said computer chip, or main processor, or camera module, uh, you would not understand it at all. If you would have had a different kind of education where you would have been introduced to very different terms and different concepts, you might have looked at the same architecture, but had described it very differently. So what I said, this description, this neutral description, is only relatively neutral. It is neutral to the, to the common context we have. And that's why at university we spend so much time in so many very basic lectures and seminars uh, to introduce you to the common context. Uh, it is necessary to make us able to even speak with each other about those things. Uh, if we would not have the context, it would all be senseless. And this context is, of course, not neutral. It has been created. There is a curriculum which has been created by people 
Um, so uh, it is, of course, the result of societal discourse. So technological descriptions are never, ever completely neutral. They can only be relatively neutral if we take a certain context for granted. Well, let's get back to this image for a moment. We have many perspectives in here already. We have started with the features. We have then spoken about the architecture and the relevance. And now we have interrelated all of those by looking at the genesis. What is missing at the moment is the individual. And the individual comes in now. Um, well, an individual like you or me, we have, of course, also a relation with an artifact. It's a very individual relation uh, we have. When we look at an artifact, or when we use an artifact, uh, we, of course, first of all, confronted with its features. And the features are all we can directly interact with, what we can use. Uh, we have no direct access to most parts of the architecture. Uh, and, of course, we have no direct means of changing the context, the relevance, the societal discourse too. When we use something like WhatsApp or this smartphone, we are confronted with the features and use the features. But, of course, when we do that, we have certain knowledge or at least assumptions about uh, things. Let's use WhatsApp again. When I use WhatsApp, of course, I use uh, the WhatsApp feature of sending text to a friend of mine or to whoever. Um, that is the feature. When I do that, I have assumptions about both the architecture and the relevance. I have an assumption that the text I enter is somehow processed in there, might be somehow encrypted and is then sent somewhere else. So those are assumptions about an architecture in there. Maybe I have the assumption uh, that there also is a user list somewhere. I have an assumption about a data structure. Now, those are assumptions I have or knowledge, pieces of knowledge I have about the architecture um, of an artifact. Um, and of course, I also have a relation to relevance. I know about the discourses about the privacy of um, communication and I have an opinion towards it and I believe certain things and other things I do not believe. So I know that the app is provided by Meta and Meta has a bad reputation. I know that. Maybe that changes how I use WhatsApp. So I would uh, use it for uh, greetings um, from uh, when I'm on holiday, no problem. But maybe uh, I would not put my most uh, secure uh, secrets uh, in WhatsApp. And that is, of course, due to a relation to some knowledge about the relevance uh, of WhatsApp. This perspective on interaction is, of course, very individual. Uh, it is only true for me in that way. And, of course, we could ask many other people, um, but that would hardly be... Um, a perspective of description because I would not have want to have a description of one certain relation but uh, uh, something a little more general so uh, that's why when we look at interaction we can also and maybe more interestingly look at interaction roles um, there are certain interaction roles associated with different kinds of people uh, different classes of people, however you want to call that, who use an artifact or have a relation towards an artifact. I do not know any good examples uh, in terms of WhatsApp here. Um, so I'll switch the example for a moment and uh, speak about Excel, like Spreadsheet, the Spreadsheet uh, software Excel, uh, because uh, there it has been uh, investigated. Many people use Excel like 
a structured notepad. They make use of the feature Excel provides of being able to write down things in an orderly fashion, like in columns and rows. That's of course a feature Excel provides us. And they use Excel that way. They put things in columns and rows, use uh, formatting, change backgrounds, uh, highlight areas, etc. That is one way of using Excel. And there is, of course, a role associated uh, with that. It's a little unclear how you would like to call those people who do it that way. Maybe uh, they are uh, the note takers. Let's call him the note takers for a moment. Other people use Excel in a different way because they uh, make use of the fact that you can calculate using Excel. You can calculate within one cell and you can also refer to what is in another cell. And uh, they use Excel like a calculator on steroids. So they are basically do the, doing things they could also do with a pocket calculator, but they are using Excel for it for some of the features it provides. So you can see interims results, etc. You know that Excel can be used for that purpose too. And the role of those people I maybe call the calculators. So they use Excel as a calculator and they themselves are the calculators or the bookkeepers. You can use different names for those, whatever you want. And then there is a third role and that role I would call the programmers. Uh, because Excel has things like if then else, it has table lookups, it has many, many things that one typically associates with programming. And people who create spreadsheets that are in that area are programmers. They are using Excel as a programming environment. So we have at least three roles, three interaction roles here. And this is maybe more interesting because that is something, of course, which can be subject of an explanation. You can say, aha, uh -huh, people who use Excel that way, uh, using these and these features and need this, this and this in uh, terms of architecture and relevance. Such roles, I'm sure, exist for all artifacts, but for some they have already been looked into and for others uh, they have not. So, this would be the full picture of Ariadne. Uh, so now I can tell you why it is called Ariadne. The term Ariadne is a reference to a mythical figure from Greek mythology where Princess Ariadne finds her way through and out of a maze. And of course that's an image for finding a way through all those perspectives, like going from one to the next and back and finding your way out of it again for a coherent explanation of a digital artifact. Uh, and of course, AR and I, you'll find on this image, it's architecture, relevance and interaction, the three basic perspectives of the Ariadne principle. Of course, accompanied by a perspective on features and all intertwined by Genesis. There's only one thing I could add to this picture, and that would be another human being. Because, of course, there is not only one human being interacting with the digital artifact. There are several. And um, uh, it makes sense to put yourself in the perspective of someone else and um, consider what the interaction of that person with the artifact is and what that means in terms of a relation or a necessity to have knowledge about architecture and relevance. If you have that, that leads to something which we could call empathy, because thinking about what someone else has in mind when using an artifact can make me understand that person and allows me to relate it to my own perspective on those things. So that would be the complete picture of the Ariadne principle. Is this now something you could use in the classroom? Can you build lessons based on this Ariadne principle? I don't think so. I think it is a step before that. Ariadne is a good way of making yourself clear where you are, 
Like, where is your perspective? What is your favorite perspective? Like a computer scientist would most likely be on the architecture side and might use Ariadne to find out more about relevance and how it came to be and maybe look at interactions. Someone else, like uh, someone maybe more from the media education uh, area, might be more on the relevance side to begin with and might find a necessity to look in more into the architecture um, in order to relate it to uh, one's own um, perspective on that. So you can locate yourself in there, you can use Ariadne to build the perspectives, to have a broad perspective on the subject. And that's of course necessary or a prerequisite for lessons based on an artifact. So Ariadne is the content analysis, the analysis you have to do before thinking about creating lessons, before planning lessons um, about a certain topic. This content analysis is a prerequisite for pedagogical approaches which focus on the explanation of digital artifacts. And one of those approaches is the hybrid interaction systems approach. And I tried to introduce, to include this approach into the Ariadne picture, which of course now becomes a little crowded, but I think it shows you where that is. We can understand the hybrid interaction systems approach by looking at its parts. There is a system and this system is indicated by the dotted lines. Within this system there are two entities and that's why it's called hybrid. There is a person here at the bottom which could for example be a pupil and then there is the artifact. The focus within that system is on the interaction. That is why it is a hybrid interaction system. While this interaction takes place, there is a shaping of the artifact. So someone who uses the artifact shapes the artifact. We are shaping the digital world uh, we are in, for example by programming it, but also by using it, by adapting it. There's a shaping going on. We make the digital world our own. At the same time, the digital artifacts shape us. So we are changed because of the existence of digital artifact and we change ourselves uh, in the chain of interactions uh, with digital artifact. This interaction this shaping and being shaped is in the center of the hybrid interaction systems approach. You see that uh, the dotted lines do not contain the whole cloud. That is because the um, content analysis we have made before, of course, has to be bigger, has to include more than what we actually use uh, in the classroom uh, for our lessons. When we think about lessons, uh, we are more narrow and within this corridor, within this smaller section uh, of architecture and relevance, we also would not speak about every aspect, uh, which of course would not make sense, but we, uh, we identify the important and relevant aspects, both in the, in the area of architecture and in the area of relevance, and relate those to each other. This hybrid interaction systems uh, approach relies on an analysis like Ariadne provides us with, uh, but of course brings in many more pedagogical concepts uh, which have to be considered in a classroom situation. If you want to know more about that and the pedagogical and didactic background of the hybrid interaction systems approach, please read the paper I have indicated for you down here. So, that was Ariadne. That was the Ariadne approach, which is a scheme, a principle, a tool for exploring and explaining digital artifacts. I hope it is of much use for you. And if you have further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us.